So yesterday, we were talking about solubility. We went over all the terminology. We went over how to use your solubility chart. And what we're going to go over today is the polar nature of water. So we're going to talk about what it means to be a polar molecule, right? what that looks like, why water is a polar molecule, and then the behaviors that polar molecules, especially water, exhibit, and why they are basically the exception to every rule we have. Okay? So we discussed earlier in the unit how atoms of different elements can form compounds, and then if electrons are gained or lost, the compound has an ionic bond and is an ionic compound. When two metals collide and react, they tend to share electrons in a covalent bond. There are different types of covalent bonds, nonpolar or polar. Okay? In a nonpolar covalent bond, the electrons are shared fairly equally. Okay? So this would be you know, um, kind of like you went to a party and people ordered pizza and it wasn't sliced, but the person who sliced it sliced it all equally okay? and everybody got the same amount of pieces. Okay? A polar molecule, the electrons are not shared equally. They spend way more time around one of the atoms than the others. Okay? This is like going to a party and you order a pizza and regardless of whether it's sliced or not, somebody eats seven-eighths of it. Okay? One person. And leaves one slice for everyone else to fight over. Which is fun to watch. But, okay, is not really practical. It's not shared. Okay? That person will not be invited back to the party. Unless it's fun to watch. Okay? But, yeah, it's probably not. All right? So, um, that's, that's what polar covalent bonds cost. The electrons are shared, but they're not shared equally. Somebody gets the electron way more often, okay, than the other than the other part. Water does this, okay? And it does this because um, oxygen and hydrogen have different abilities to hold on to or attract electrons, okay? The measure of that is called electronegativity. If you look on your periodic table, okay, electronegativity is the number immediately above the atomic symbol, right? So, um, if we're looking at iron, which is the key on yours, okay? If we're looking at that, electronegativity of iron is that 1.8 that's right above the Fe, okay? That number tells us how tightly that particular element holds on to electrons in a compound, okay? If we look at the number for oxygen, it's 3.4. The most electronegative thing there is, I believe, is fluorine and it's 4.0, okay? So oxygen is highly electronegative. That means it really holds on to electrons very, very tightly. It does not share well, okay? It holds on to those electrons. If you look at hydrogen, hydrogen's reasonably electronegative, okay? It's not on my chart. Um, it's reasonably electronegative, it's what? 2.2, uh, so it's a you know, it's not weak, but it's also not like oxygen at 3.4. So, when the hydrogen and oxygen bond together, the electrons don't orbit the whole molecule equally. They end up down by oxygen a lot more. So, if this is our shared, if these two electrons here are our shared electrons, okay, rather than sitting right there, okay, and orbiting kind of like, like this kind of equally, Okay, that would be kind of an equal orbit around the two molecules. What they end up doing is more like this. And they spend way more of their time around the oxygen than they do around the hydrogen. Okay, oxygen holds on to those electrons more tightly than hydrogen does. So they spend a lot less time around the hydrogen atom than they do around the oxygen. Now, here's what that causes. It ends up that you get one end of the molecule that's negatively charged because all the electrons are hanging out there, okay? And the two hydrogen atoms, which are just a proton, end up sticking out out the top of the um, molecule and they're positively charged. So you end up with these two positively charged points on the top of the molecule and you end up with these negatively charged points at the bottom because the electrons are hanging out there way more often, like we said, right? 
So you end up getting this situation. So this end of the molecule down here is negative, and this, these ends up here are positive. Now, since we've got now essentially charged ends, okay, the positive end of that water molecule is going to be attracted to the negative end of other water molecules because opposites attract. Okay? So what ends up happening is polar molecules can form these weak bonds with each other because of this attraction between the hydrogen and the negative end of the other molecule. That's why it's called hydrogen bonding. Okay? Hydrogen bonds are very weak. They break easily, but they also reform very easily. Okay? And so they can hold these molecules together. You've probably seen this if you've ever seen surface tension. Right? So you know how you can, if you pour very carefully, you can actually fill a glass slightly overfilled before it actually spills. Right? That's because all the water molecules that are in that thin film of surface tension have hydrogen bonded together and made themselves just a little stronger than they would be otherwise. Okay? But making sense? It allows water to do a lot of really strange things that most other molecules cannot do. Okay. So sharing's not always equal. Like we said, some electron or some elements are more electronegative. Okay, we were talking about that. And what we end up getting is the positive ends that we see here and here. Okay? And the negative end down below is actually two negative points. And so as a result, one water molecule, so there's one here in the middle can bond to four other water molecules by a hydrogen bond. Okay? Now, a hydrogen bond doesn't change the chemical. It's not a chemical reaction or anything like that. It's just this weak bond that kind of ebbs and flows and okay, forms and breaks and forms and breaks. Okay? But they can form here, okay, and then there can be almost this net between these five water molecules. And of course, each one of these water molecules can bond to four other water molecules, and that's what forms that surface tension that we can see okay, um, with water. Right? If you, you know, just like, let's say, waxed your car, okay, you get the water beads and just sits in these little drops okay, on the surface of the car instead of kind of running okay, in a sheen. Okay, it just beads up. Surface of leaves, same thing. Right? You always see on the surface of a leaf in the morning, the dew is in these big beads because the leaf is covered with wax. A waxy cuticle, right? And the surface tension of the water can actually allow it to bond to the leaf with a hydrogen bond. So I actually have to like shake the leaf to get the water to bond. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So that's what we're looking at. So anytime you have um, electrons not being shared equally, you have a polar covalent bond. So that's what there is between the hydrogen and the oxygen in a water molecule. Between water molecules, those are hydrogen bonds, okay, so they're different. Right. Polar covalent bonds, still really, really strong. Any type of covalent bond is really strong. Okay. The only difference is with polar ones, the electrons get distributed weirdly, okay, and you end up with a positive pole and a negative pole to the, um, to the molecule, which is why it's called polar. Question on polar bonds and hydrogen bonds. Wait, how would you describe the difference between them? Sorry. Uh, well, the, the difference is the, the polar covalent bonds are between the hydrogen and the oxygen. The hydrogen bonds are between water molecules. Okay. Yeah. All right, so the water molecule, like we said, is shaped kind of like a right angle. All right, so um, there's the two positively charged points, and then there's two negatively charged points at the other end, okay? And that's what allows it to uh, bond polar, or, or sorry, hydrogen bond to other, um, other water molecules or other polar molecules. So on the quiz, that like the quiz we didn't do, what would be the answer to that? I'm trying to remember what that question was. It's like in one word. Oh, uh, it was either cohesion or adhesion. Yeah, which we haven't got to yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, questions there? All right, so water does all these weird things, right? Okay, most things, when they um, cool, they contract. When they turn into a solid, their solid takes up less space than the liquid counterpart. All right? um, 
Water is an exception to that. Water does contract as it cools, but water is most dense at about 4 degrees Celsius. <coughs> After 4 degrees Celsius, the polar nature of water causes a repulsion to start. Okay? So in this diagram here on the bottom left, okay, this is what the water molecules look like in liquid water at around 3 or 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? They're still able to change places with each other, but they've contracted down and the space between them is very small. But as they get to that point, now they're so close together that the negative ends are getting close to other negative ends for water molecules. And positive ends are getting close to other positive ends. And what do light charges do? They repel each other. So they start getting so close that they actually bounce back. There's almost like a, a, a very sudden um, elastic reaction between the two. And they bounce away from each other. And then water freezes into a solid, which is crystalline ice. Okay? Now, the way that this happens is different every time, which is why there are no two identical snowflakes. That's probably not entirely true. I'm sure at some point in history, two snowflakes have looked alike. Okay, but I mean, <laughs> you, you've heard that expression before. It's no, there's no two snowflakes alike. Well, it's sort of true, okay? Because every time this repulsion happens, the crystalline shape is just a little bit different. Okay? And so the, the crystals look a little different each and every time. Okay? But what it causes is for the water molecules to now be farther apart as a solid than they were as a liquid, which is completely against the rules. Almost every other substance in its solid form, the particles are closer together than they are in the liquid form. Okay? Water is an exception, which is why ice floats water. If you had liquid mercury and solid mercury, so you had like a mercury cube instead of an ice cube, and you put it into liquid mercury, it sinks the bottom. Okay. Water doesn't do that. And life has evolved around that property. I mean, think of what would happen to all the fish that live in a lake and all the other aquatic organisms that live in a lake if ice was more dense than liquid water. The lake would freeze from the bottom up, which would mean the lakes would all freeze solid. Instead of having them freeze at the top, the ice is less dense, it freezes across the top, creates a layer of like, like kind of buffer between the really frigidly cold outside air and the liquid water underneath. Okay? This is, I mean, that's. All the, all the aquatic organisms live in that liquid water under the ice all winter. Okay? And they're looking at like lots of the moons of the big planets out in the outer solar system. They've all got this outer crust of ice with liquid, oh, not all of them, but many of them have these liquid oceans underneath this thick, collect, really, really thick layer of ice on the top. And it's because ice is less dense than liquid water. Okay? Still made of the same material, but because this happens, this polar molecule makes them push away, you get the particles being further apart, and so it's less dense and floats on top. Okay? So that's one of those weird behaviors of water and why it happens. Okay? And we all know, obviously, that water expands okay, when it freezes. If you've ever um, frozen a water bottle, right? you know it rounds out the bottom and you can't set it on the, on the counter without it falling over. Okay? Or it breaks the bottle. If it's a glass bottle, it breaks the bottle. Okay? Um, it also is what causes erosion, right? Water trickles into the crack in a rock and then freezes and the water expands and can actually break the rock. Um, then how does it work when we're at, like swimming or something? Like if we hold our breath, then we float, but as soon as we breathe in, we start to sink. Well, that has to do yeah, with the air in your lungs, right? Air is less dense than water. So if I, if I, wear, if I like wear water wings, I don't swim well. Okay. Um, that, you know, I blow them up and they're full of air. Okay, the air is less dense than water, so those parts would float my head probably stay out of the water. But, okay, um, yeah, and same with like any kind of life preserver, right? It's got pockets of air that float, right? They're trapped, so they don't want to go down below the water. So even when we're like, how do we stay? Because like, if the ice kind of floats to the top, you're not like, I'm not getting it off very well. What are we trying to say? I guess we know we don't start immediately sinking as well. I immediately 
missing. <laughs> but I jump off a diving board, I go straight down into the water. Okay? I come up because, yeah, my lungs are full of air. So I'm naturally going to come up because I've got this trapped air inside of me that wants to go to the surface. Okay? Now, um, it's morbid. <laughs> to qualify this, like, you know, de dead bodies float, right? Because they, during the decomposition process, lots of air gets put into this, so that part floats, but eventually they fill with water and sink. Okay? That's why the mafia would, if they were going to, you know, take somebody out, they'd give them cement shoes. You guys heard that term? No. That's how the mafia used to get rid of people. They, they put their feet in boxes, fill the boxes with cement. <coughs> So they'd have cement shoes and they throw them off a bridge. Why don't they just put like giant weights on their feet and then... The well, see, the problem with the weights and the chains is they can fall off and oh. the body starts to make... Fair enough. Yeah, you put those feet in cement, I mean, eventually they'll... But Fair enough. It drowns them anyway. Keeps them underwater for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll still... That's why, that's why the expression like sleeps with the fishes the what? comes oh. from. Right? Yeah, you guys have never seen The Godfather, right? No. Okay. You're too young to watch The Godfather. That's probably why you haven't seen it. But, uh, yeah, that they have this expression, so-and-so sleeps with the fishes. That means they got cement shoes and they threw them off the cliff. <laughs> There's your history lesson. Yeah. Okay, so hydrogen bonds, like we said, are these weak bonds they form, but they cause this repulsion. Okay, polar molecules cause this repulsion okay, uh, to happen that cause the water to expand as it freezes. Okay? Now, this stuff, life has evolved around the presence of water and around the properties of water. Okay? Plants, when they transport water from their roots to their leaves, expend no energy to do so. Okay? It requires no energy for a plant to transport water against gravity from its, leaf, from its roots to its leaves. Because it uses the polar nature of water to transport the water. Okay, so here's what happens in, a, in like, let's say, a tall, like, giant redwood tree, the tallest trees there are. Okay? Water evaporates from the surface of the leaf. Okay? When it does so, it's hydrogen bonded to other water molecules that are still in the leaf and down the tree. Okay? So as this water molecule is evaporating out of the leaf, it's still hydrogen bonded to one that hasn't evaporated yet and is lower down in the tree. So as it evaporates and leaves the tree, it pulls on the ones below. Okay? You guys ever played with a barrel of monkeys? It's like that. They're linked, like the barrel of monkeys. Right? You can stick a whole bunch of them up. Okay? It's like that. Okay? So as you lift on the top one, you're only directly pulling on the top one. But because it's attached to all the others, when you lift one, you lift them all. And that's how water works. As the water evaporates, it pulls on all the water molecules below that are in the tubes of the tree. Okay? Now, the tubes in the tree, are they big or small? Small. Yeah, microscopic in fact. They're only about 10 micrometers across. Okay, oh, I should say 10, 100 micrometers across. They're really, really small. Okay, really, really tiny. Um, to give you an idea, there's 1,000 micrometers in a millimeter. Okay, so they're really, really small. Because this process wouldn't work in, some, in a big tube. Right? Um, so if you have, like, let's say you're, you're drinking like a fountain drink, right? You've got your, your straw in there. Okay? Is there a, kind of a fixed size for those? Generally, there is, right? You can get the big fat ones, but they really only work for Slurpees that are semi-frozen because when it's frozen, they're stuck, the stuff is stuck together better. If you try and drink the liquid with the really big straw, it's much more difficult, okay? And that's because the polar, those hydrogen bonds don't work as well. They're not very strong. So they can't support a column of water that's got this diameter, but they can support a column of water with a small diameter. Okay? So in the same process that happens in a small straw is what's happening inside the trunk of the tree. The water bonds to itself by hydrogen bonds, but it'll also bond to the side of the straw or the side of the tree okay, by a hydrogen bond as well. So you've got cohesion, that's the link between two water molecules, and adhesion. That's the polar, or sorry, the hydrogen bond between water and something else, okay, causing them to adhere to each other. It's what keeps the water droplet on a leaf. That's adhesion. It's a hydrogen bond there. Um, so how does all the water not get like drained out of the tree and dehydrated when they're coming up? Like, is it that slowly, or is, does it break? Well, it's slowly, yes. Um, but I mean, a tree can get dehydrated if there's no water, 
right? If, if the just soil dries out, this process stops working. So now, do they just keep getting pulled up till there's no water left in the tree, or does it somehow snap off? The tree can control how much water evaporates from the leaves. There's little um, uh, cells called guard cells, and they change shape. As water evaporates, salt gets left behind in the leaf. And that's actually what causes the water to move to the leaf, is this salt. It's called, called osmosis. We'll talk about it in biology. Okay? So the water moves towards the salt. Eventually, though, uh, the salt starts to build up in the leaf, and that causes the guard cells to change their shape and close off the hole. So as a plant starts to get stressed, it'll stop evaporating water, stop carrying out photosynthesis, and then kind of can go into reservation mode, right? oh, or right. conservation mode. Okay, so what we're seeing at a molecular level is what we see right here. Okay, so these are the water molecules, these little blue Mickey Mouse heads. Okay, um, they're, they're hydrogen bonded to each other, right? So that would be cohesion. This would be cohesion right here. Okay? And they're also hydrogen bonded to the inside of the tree, which is called the xylem. Okay, they're hydrogen bonded there. So there's adhesion, water molecules, hydrogen bonding to other polar molecules, and there's cohesion. Water molecules, hydrogen bonding to each other. Okay? Everyone with me on that? Yeah. Okay, so those are going to be important terms that you are going to need to know. Right? So cohesion okay, um, happens between um, two water molecules, and adhesion, one water molecule and a different polar molecule. So hydrogen bonds cause the water that's leaving the leaves, as we were talking about, to tug on the water molecules further down the vessel, okay? And the upward pull is transmitted all along the vessel, all the way to the root, okay? Adhesion, okay, also plays a role, okay? And we can see adhesion here, the water droplets stuck to the surface of the leaf, okay? It's the same process inside the xylem tubes. It just sticks to the inside of the tube, and that can, you know, keep it from falling back down, as long as the tubes aren't too big. Okay. The tubes get too big, then the column of water in the middle weighs too much, and the hydrogen bonds aren't strong enough to support that column of water. Right? So that would be like if I was trying to drink water through a straw that was like this big, okay, like five centimeters in diameter. That would be hard, okay, because I would have to create a lot of suction to support the column of water. It would weigh a lot, okay. Whereas in a very small straw, it would be very very easy because the column of water wouldn't weigh very much because it would be very, very small. Okay. Okay. This is kind of what happens when you have, how many people ever had like a, like a really thick milkshake? Right? When you first get the thick milk, you get to the Peter's house. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, now i got to go to Peter's. I haven't been to Peter's since COVID. Oh. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, when you first get that milkshake, right, and you're trying to pull the milkshake up the straw, the straw just collapses, right? And that's because that, that is heavy, right? It's, it's not just cold and thick, it's also very heavy, okay? And so when you're trying to create that suction, it's nearly impossible. The tube collapses before you can create enough pressure to hold it up, okay? Once you get it to the top of the straw, it'll actually stay there. It'll bond to the inside of the straw. Apparently, you can do this. I tried one afternoon. Two hours of my life, I'll never get back. <laughs> Okay. So apparently, you can put a paper clip okay, on the meniscus, the surface tension of a glass of water. The key is you have to like bend the pointy ends up so that they don't break the, the meniscus. They don't cause the hydrogen bonds to break, because hydrogen bonds break easily, but reform easily. Okay. Now, they, they are, like I said, fairly weak, but when you get a lot of them, they can be reasonably strong. Anybody ever skipped a rock on the water? Yeah. You do that because of surface tension. Okay. It's way easier to skip a rock on a still lake than it is across a river. Okay. Because in a river, the surface tension is being broken all the time, on a big scale anyway, like for a rock. Okay. The surface tension is being broken all the time, so it's hard to get the rock to skip. Okay. But on a lake that's not getting disturbed, it's much easier to get that rock to skip. Okay. It's also how bugs can sit on the surface. They actually sit in that surface film Okay? And they spread their weight out because their legs can spread out, like water striders and mayflies and stuff like that. Okay? They can sit on the surface okay? using that polar nature of water to not sink. Okay. 
you over that idea. Okay, so that's what I was talking about there. Okay, there are lots of animals that use the polar nature of water to survive. Okay, the Jesus lizard, okay, the one that can run across the water. Okay, same idea, it's just using surface tension, but it has to run really fast. Okay, because if it slows down, it'll sink. Okay, going to give you guys about a five minute break here, and then I'm going to outline your toxin project, which we're going to work on tomorrow and Monday. We'll have the Chromebooks. It's a research project. It's not going to be due until October 4th. A long way off. Okay? But you'll have tomorrow's class and Monday's class to work on it. So you've got a five minute break. You need to go get a drink or something like that. Just do it quietly. Don't disturb anybody else. Remember, you've got to have your mask on to do that. 